team, but we do know that we've been in a season and we're continuing to be in one that, where that's incredibly important. Um, we're thinking about moving beyond lockdown. We're thinking about new presbytery plans, presbytery reform, and a society that's changing all around us. How do we, as leaders of local congregations, continue to lead into these new times? How is it possible to add anything more to our to-do list? Is it possible to grow our capacity in any way? How do we know what we would leave behind? How do we change congregational expectations and bring people with us on a journey? What might be the particular challenges that you're facing? Is it okay to say no? And what does God have to say about all of this? Um, I'm hoping we're going to touch on uh, lots of these areas in the time that we've got together. We're hoping today that we're going to be able to have a conversation um, and that there'll be opportunity for, for as many as we'd like to contribute to do so. But we do have a panel with us today um, and we're going to take time to introduce you to them. So what we're asking for at the moment is if you could be on mute. Um, if as you listen to people, you've got questions that you'd like to put in the chat function, please do do that. We'll be really happy to take them at any point that we can fit them in. If there's a question that you'd love to ask directly, then please put up your hand and when we get to that point, we'll come to ask you that question. But we also have one or two pre-submitted questions that we'll kick off with shortly. Um, but let me just introduce myself and I'll hand you over to the panel who'll introduce themselves, making sure that they're not on mute as I come to them and, and then we'll we'll get going. So I'm Kay Kathkar, I head up the education and training team, working on Ascend and delighted just to kind of hold this session together for you but really to allow um, everybody who has something to contribute today to speak. So can I come to Liz now? Liz, you introduce yourself please. Thanks Kay, I'm, I'm Liz Crumlish. I've been a minister for over 25 years. I've worked in hospital chaplaincy and in parish ministry. Six years ago I left parish ministry to launch the Path of Renewal project and so that's what I've been doing for the last six years, just um, working with ministers and congregations, helping them discern what it is God is asking us of today, asking of us today, and how we join in the mission of God. That's Path of Renewal in a nutshell. Brilliant. Thank you, Liz. Great to have you with us. Rich. Rich Robinson. Uh celebrating my 19th wedding anniversary today. So wonderful to be with you. That's probably the most important thing I can tell you. I'm based in Edinburgh. We've been, I'm an Englishman uh, living in Scotland. So I apologise in, in on behalf of the whole nation for Friday nights, but um, we, shall, we shall have some fun. So based in Edinburgh, I am part of Central Church, formerly Morningside Baptist and work with CAM. So seeking to support and create pioneering initiatives in the Celtic lands. And then I also spend time, I run a charity called Catalyze Change. So we coach and train Christian leaders, entrepreneurs and writers. And Rich, we're delighted to have you here today. You come not just with permission to bring an outside perspective, but with a bit of a wild card that you're probably going to bring some thoughts today that, that will come from a different context and we hope will stretch, challenge and inspire us. So great to have you. Uh, Eleanor. Eleanor, you're on mute. Hi, uh, I'm Eleanor Ellen McMahon. I've been in ministry for nearly 27 years. Uh, 15, nearly 16 of those, I was in Paisley, uh, working in the North End and in Fergusley Park. And for the last 11 years, I've been a member of the Interim and Transition Ministry team. Um, I'm presently on my fifth placement in Gretna Old, Gretna St Andrews, Half Morton, and Kirkpatrick Fleming Church of Scotland. Um, and so I've been around both in ministry, Place for Hope, and with as a, a team member of the coaching team within the church. Fabulous. And Neil. Hi, I'm Neil Urquhart, minister at Fullerton Parish Church. I've uh, been here for 32 years, only parish that I've served really. Uh, we serve a priority area. Uh, and over that 32 years, I suppose I've seen at least three congregations that have evolved and and other ones evolving at the moment. Uh, we've rebranded ourselves as Fullerton Connections, which is a creative crossroads for caring relationships. And I'm convener in our Urban Commandment Presbytery. Uh, I'm convener of the Pioneer Group that has 
uh, just launched uh, th six new projects, which is is, is exciting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great to have you. So a super panel that we have today. They're going to have a go answering some questions and then they're going to want to engage um, in whatever way we can. So, um, Eleanor, you were asked to come today just to kick us off with a few thoughts and experiences that you have that will whet our appetite and get us thinking into this space today. So it'd be great to hear from you, Eleanor. OK, thank you, Kay. Um, my name's Eleanor, as I said, Minister for nearly 27 years. I was ordained in St James's Church of Scotland in Paisley, and I've gone, gone through, through ministry training that took this girl from a church extension charge in Hill House in Hamilton, where we sang choruses with gusto and landed her in a very traditional church with a belfry with eight bells and a red robed choir with attitude. It took some time for these worlds to merge as the congregation working with its neighbours ventured into the priority areas of the North End and of per Fergusley Park, where the folks there taught me more about gospel loving than I could them. It was a challenging time and of course I was young. Um, there was team working, there was moving a traditional congregation forward, working priority areas. But I did all of that and did all the things that you would expect to happen, particularly of a church going through the 90s. Then uh, I had to do it against a background of a, of a diagnosed health condition. On the second anniversary of my ordination to ministry, I got the news that I'd been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis with perhaps a secondary condition of epilepsy. I entered my third year of ministry with no car and with a confused sense of being. Have they told you how long it'll be before you can't walk, said one of my old ladies brightly one Sunday morning over coffee. And even now I can feel the anger rising within me and she really doesn't know how close I came to belting her one, to be honest. I met the challenge by going out to prove that anything you could do, I could do it better. I could do it with more vigour, enthusiasm, by working longer hours. The GP had encouraged me to attend an MS support group and I went along finding that those with MS got big orange badges with their names to wear and the helpers got big green ones with their names on it and that I would be an MSer. And on that first evening, arriving confused about who I was and where I was and why my body had let me down, I was met with a list of their needs. They needed someone to bring sandwiches to their next meeting and to join their committee. I never went back. I didn't want the label and I recognised within it that we did, that we did what, 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 what to, they were saying to people when they came to church. We saw them not as people hungry for the gospel or needing a listening ear or a place for comfort, but fodder for the rotas and the maintenance of the past. During those 15, nearly 16 years in St James's, I had a very supportive congregation and colleagues around. For periods when I wasn't driving, they picked me up and they dropped me off. Bouts of optic neuritis makes you see the world as if you're looking through a prism to the extent that you can't really cross the road by yourself. They asked after my health. Health, they told me to look after myself. Oh, but by the way, if I could just see my way to doing whatever. And I have many, many fond memories of what we did and what we built. Though within six years of my departure, this church that I had given so much to dissolved. The shared working dispersed. It's eight bells in some barn around Scotland. It's hymn books and other trappings that we had talked about, argue about argued about at a Kirk session meeting scavenged by other congregations. But it was the right decision for them. And though it was worked through with hurt and angst and upset, the church they came to realise could not simply exist for its members. Around the 15 year mark, in ministry, I reached the point where I knew I couldn't give any more. And then almost by accident, I had a transformational season. I was invited to take part of what was then called the Priority Area Coaching Cohort, beginning with a weekend, meet, meeting a coach every three, four weeks, 
and a finishing weekend. And by the end, I had picked up what was a developing interest in mediation and I had given my per myself permission to pursue it. I had applied and become an interim minister. I'd even bought a house. I find that I can never sing the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, because that was a hymn the congregation couldn't sing after I announced that I was leaving them. It was the right time that I left. I couldn't hang on any longer. I had to recognise I was merely human with a set amount of energy. I had, and still do, choose very carefully where I place my energies. I came to realise that it wasn't for me to save the church, certainly not all by myself, or even my part of it. Today, I still think I'm superhuman. And while I cannot see MS as a gift, I know that God does use it to help me measure my life. I have a love of God and while it's not fashionable to say, I have a love for the church. I have a drive and a passion for it. Not to make it perfect or free from all its imperfections, but still annoy and frustrate and even at times have hurt me. But I love it because at its best, it's surprising, it's startling, it's overwhelming, it's comforting, it's frightening. And I'm still called to be one of its ministers within it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, we asked Eleanor to kick off because we are really keen for this time today to enable honesty um, and self-reflection, as well as to consider practical um, steps that we might need to be taking for our churches and for our own ministries. Everything that is happening externally to us is having an internal impact upon us. And so the panel today want to engage at a personal level um, and not just at an operational level as we think about managing new and changing expectations. So we're going to kick off just with one of the questions that was pre-submitted. Um, and then, like I say, if you want to engage with what is being said, please do use the chat function. Um, we have a couple of questions that we could go on to or we can um, deepen in the, in the area that we kick off with. We are just going to see how we go. The panel members are all going to take themselves off mute, um, but everybody else, if you could remain on mute until you're invited to speak, if you've put your hand up and I will invite you to do so. So Liz, Rich, Eleanor and Neil, and we, we, if you talk over each other, I know you you're polite <laughs> and you'll you'll allow one another to go first. So first question it says, I can see change coming. The particular context that this came from is a linkage, but that, there's the statement. I can see change coming. How do I start now preparing my people for a different landscape ahead? I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. And uh, a, a couple of thoughts, Kay. Um, <clears throat> I think surprise is one of the worst things for people. So yes, we can love a surprise birthday party, but a surprise tax bill or sort of a meeting at work that we've not planned for. So surprise is something that often puts people on the back foot. So actually starting early is, is vital so that it's something that is a conversation that people can own and explore both the pain and the prize of rather than it be sprung on people or done to people. So I think starting early, I would really affirm. I think as you start that process with your people, it's both talking to the crowd as well as understanding who is your core. So there'll be an, an opportunity and a need to be able to talk more publicly with larger groups. But I would also encourage the, the person who asks the question to say, who are my five to 15 key influences within my context? How do I actually have a one-on-one -on -one or one-on two or three, so smaller numbers, to be able to talk through here honestly, vulnerably, what are the questions, What? why are you excited, why are you frustrated, what are you uncertain about? So it isn't just one person trying to communicate to everyone, but it's actually five, 10, 15 people that will have a different voice, a different perspective, um, so I would say start early, communicate both with the core as well as the, the wider community. And then the final thing is, is to name, name both the pain and the prize. 
So there's nothing worse than, and people can see through when you're trying to sugarcoat something or kind of blow fresh air and, and kind of smoke and go, it's all going to be wonderful and they're amazing and it's all going to be fine and blah, blah. People can just see, see it and smell it and, and know it. So actually being able to name this is why the change might be hard. This is some of the emotions it might bring up in you. These are some of my uncertainties. This is what we'll have to work out, as well as this is the potential for greater unity or greater mission for us to learn as a, as a congregation. So I think start early, talk to the core and the community and name both the pain and the prize of, of what is ahead in a sense of an exploring and a developing conversation rather than with a, a certainty that you, you don't necessarily have right now. So they, they would just be a few. Yeah. There's something about us as leaders owning our own vulnerability because we don't know what's ahead. So, you know, identifying with others that, you know, we don't have the answers that they might well suspect that, but, but just naming that and then um, looking at folks perception of loss you know because in every change there is some um, measure of loss and helping them to or or sitting with them while they acknowledge that loss it mean it may be trivial things to you or it may seem trivial to you but just the fact that you've sat with people and acknowledged the loss that they perceive um, goes a long way so tapping into our own vulnerability to be able to be vulnerable with others Mm -hmm. I, I would have to ag agree with all that's that's been said. Um, for me, two words always jump out, and it's honesty and transparency. Mm -hmm. um, honesty with your folks and transparent in your processes, and that, that that you're not hiding things from from them. Um, I think it's also that we sometimes look at, at the bigger picture. What do we need to do if a linkage is going into a union, or if we're looking to bring parishes together? And it's important that we, we get the structures in place, the governance in place, I know that, but it's also quite important that we look after the little things. Um, so for us, the fact that when two churches come together, one church puts the coffee into the cups and pours water into it, and another church, the other congregation makes coffee in the pot and then pours it into the cups, that's actually a major difference and it makes people seem different. And it's actually kind of giving them permission to actually work these things through. It's acknowledging that there are differences, um, but also finding where the great touching points are. Thanks, Eleanor. And I think, you know, vision obviously is, is critical in all of this. And if you've got two congregations coming together, you, you may have two quite clearly different visions uh, so there needs to be an understanding and there needs to be a coming together and an owning of a fresh vision and uh, you know what what values what, what what's really important to you and and what vehicles can can become the the aid to realizing this new vision because the thing that I'm always saying to our folk is that if you aim for nothing you'll hit it every time uh, really vision is critical uh, and 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 in this time of transition and, and uncertainty, there'll, there'll be a lot of questions, huge questions. You know, wh where have we come from? This grief, yes. Um, but but there's, here's this question, where are we going? Where's God leading us? And, and through this vulnerability that we're talking about, this honesty, um, you know, God is still God and, and surely God wants to lead us through this. You know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, we're doomed, I tell you, we're doomed, which is the typical Scottish uh, dad's army approach. But but here is here is a positive possibility in us coming together. So I would say, you know, positivities as well as the appreciating the negativity and, and owning it and recognizing it and working through the grief, that that there that, that there's there's got to be a positivity that comes out of it as well with the vision. Great, thank you. Another pre-submitted question. I, I started some new things in lockdown, but now old expectations are creeping back in as things get busier again and there aren't enough hours in the day. How do I decide what I'm going to do? I think you've got to work out what energises you. I think you've got to work out that what gives you energy, what gives you that sense of joy, fulfilment, 
uh, what what is encouraging for others um and and what is it that drains you what is it that's taking away your spirit in, in a sense um and and i think again i would go back to open conversation with your folks you've got to be honest and say we can't do all these things um and 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 help them um uh, see that uh, in, in a sense help them uh, both give you permission and you give them permission and it, it comes down to that ongoing development in terms of 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 of, of, of vision and, and and things that neil was saying just a moment ago um but i think you've got to work out where your energy lies there's something about um, using the disruption that we've all faced to to take us forward to you know, it is an opportunity to stop those things that were just falling on from what Eleanor was saying, that were killing us, that were zapping our spirits, you know, and to go with the things that actually bring life. And, and you know, to, I was going to say invite God into all that. God, of course, is in all of it, but consciously sit with God, you know, and work out, is, is this the direction you want us to take? Or... You know, is there something we need to pick up that we that, that we drop that we shouldn't have dropped? So there's, there's a lot of um, toing and froing, but um, working out what has been opportune to just let go of and never look back. Mm. Yeah, I think li listening, uh, listening to God, listening to your body, listening to yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Um, making sure you, you look after yourself, you look after your congregation. Um, uh, you know, I think what I'm in the process of doing along with my congregation is, is, and we had a session on Sunday afternoon there, where we just had folk come together to, to ask, what, what's God been saying through all of this? What, what's God saying to us now? What are we to let go of? What are we to take up? Uh, and so that's as a congregation, but yes, is that personally, uh, we've got to, you know, the, one of the questions at the beginning there that was set up was, can we say no? Uh, and and, and mo most certainly we have to say no, because we have to remember that in saying yes to something, we're actually saying no to something else. And so it's, it's, and often we have the choice between good and good and, and good and the best. You know, what is the best? Uh, often we can end up just doing lots of good stuff, lots of activity, but we've missed the best because we've not taken that time to, to, to pause this pregnant pause to really listen and search and seek and what, what are you really saying here God so uh, that, that's my take on it. What if all the energy has completely gone and the prospect of moving forward just isn't possible? Mm -hmm. You take a holiday it's okay to take a holiday and it's okay to take time off and days off um, and, and it may well be at this point in time, we've been through lockdowns, um, we're, we're, we're all tired, we're coming up to our summer hall, and, and we have this great depth of tiredness, and, and, and so that's the first step, but, but holidays in itself will not remove that great deep-seated tiredness. Um, and I think that's where you have to go for an additional resource that will help and support you as you think through what you need to do next. And so it's going into the spiritual direction. It's going into the coaching. It's going into whatever appeals to you and will help strengthen you at this point in time. And I, I think, and this this is not a, a Church of Scotland thing. This is a, a church thing that often I would I would say, if there's ten people in the room, there'll be fourteen opinions. So y you are in a situation where you will disappoint people. It's it's not you will get it right and everyone come online. It really will be choosing who you disappoint and how you disappoint them. So I think in terms of expectation, just knowing that nobody knows what the next six 12 months will look like a decision made now may need to be changed in three months or i mean we, we've been with sort of nicola sturgeon and something changes every week so there really isn't that same solidity of the ground of we are choosing to do this for the next six months 12 months 18 months there really is that sense of everyone has an opinion 
we have to make decisions that are open to review and, and to process. And I think to, to Neil's point in terms of what, what gives you life, what gives you passion, I, I think there really is a sense of what should you be doing as the minister? What should we be doing as the church are actually two different questions and they're often conflated. And, and so it's a wonderful time to actually turn that question on, on its head and say, perhaps you should consider doing that. So it, it may actually be a great opportunity and you don't want open season in the church and everyone who has a suggestion doing everything, but it is a great opportunity to say, okay, here's, here's five things that different people within the church think we should pick up. Could you be the answer to your opinion and your question? So could you, if you pick that up, I'm more than happy as the minister to coach you and support you and help you to do it rather than the church, which in brackets means the minister, you should do these these five things. So I do think to, to Liz's comment of using the disruption and having conversations, it's saying, let's have an open conversation. What has God been doing? What do we feel is our response? And then who should be leading that response? What should you be doing? I be doing, nobody be doing? And how do we shift and really bring about a greater dispersal of the leadership responsibility within the church in this space? And, and we're not resetting busy, stressed with a giant to-do list. We're actually trying to reset with three to five leaders that we are helping to start, restart or start new things. And it, it may be that we're done uh, and and we need to go to the doctor and you know I think sometimes us ministers have difficulty actually asking for help and and uh, you know blessed are the peace blessed are the are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Peterson translates that as uh, blessed are you when you're at the end of your rope because at the end of your rope there's more of God and and that might be the stage we've reached where, I mean, I remember five years into the ministry, I was heading for a nervous breakdown. Um, my late father uh, had been a minister and one of his difficulties had been saying no. And he, he probably took his life in the end. So I have that backdrop for me and my life in ministry. And, and I was five years into the ministry and I was thinking, what, where am I headed with all this? I was doing so many home communions. I was doing this and that. The next thing I was trying to do it all, and and I took I took a month. I took a, a I went to a mission evangelism course with John Campbell. It was once a month. You took the whole day, and I made sure I, I was out for that that whole day. And I and I, I went for, I went to that conference for twelve months, and it was revelation for me because I re, it just getting into that space where I was able to listen and just relax and be and take a perspective of where I am at, at, at in my church, I realised that the greatest handicap was not my uh, not my congregation's expectations of me, which were very high. I'd followed a ministry of 36 years, um, but it was actually my own expectations of myself, which were based on workaholic tendencies of people I'd worked with and, and ministries that I'd thoroughly appreciated and learned lots from, but I had in built in me, uh, it was partly personality as well, because I'm an activist, uh, but I had I had within me this expectation myself, which was just unrealistic, but that was a watershed for me. And, and I was able to look for the help that I needed and, and, and that changed the course of my ministry. Thanks, Neil. Um, Terry Peterson says that um, she's to have a colleague who said ministry is about managing disappointment and there's obviously folk uh, connecting with that. I want to go to Hanukkah's question. Um, she asks, how do you personally deal with the situation when your own possible departure could be the perhaps necessary catalyst for change, but there might not be a clear future beyond your departure for the congregation? So that's a personal question about the impact of possible change with no clear um, road of travel. I leave co congregations quite often. Um, I leave congregations every every 18 months, two years, two and a half years. Um, and, and no matter whether you're leaving them because they've reached a more positive place or whether they've reached a plateau, uh, from which uh, you cannot move them. Um, it's recognising that you have reached that point 
uh, you as an individual. There are all sorts of other complications that come in because there, there, there are family commitments, there's, there could be schooling for children, there can be all of these other things, uh, uh, jobs for spouses and all of these kind of things. So it's, 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 it's never ever an easy decision. And I think probably there's a sense where you have to free yourself from the guilt of both remaining and the guilt of leaving. Um, and not allow uh, that as and when it does happen, because, you know, I'm an interim minister, but I always say we're all interim. We're all interim and we're all transitional, um, no matter whether it's six months or 60 years. Um, and, and, and so it's, 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 it's working that out, taking time to discern it, preparing the congregation in the different ways that, 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 that we do and we can do. Um, but at the same time, um, freeing yourself of that anxiety and guilt. And if you feel it's right, then you've got to go for it. My, yeah, okay. go, go on, Liz, ladies first. Yeah, thanks, Rich. I think if nothing else, this, this season, um, my hope would be that, that leaders have um, built up their own support networks so um you know the people who who will coach the people who will sit with them in pastoral supervision the people who will accompany them who will take them back and and i think this is what i've done for the last year in part of renewal sat with groups of ministers and took them back to thinking about what called you into this role and what calls you now you know what what is god asking of you now and how can you um, go forward with that, knowing knowing that you're doing the right thing and that you have this different support mechanisms in, in place. So there's an acknowledgement of, of completely where it's at and, and where you feel you're being called to. That, that kind of deepening of spiritual practice that um, actually equips you and helps you to take things forward as you need to do. Thanks. Rich? Uh, my my slight my slightly tongue in cheek answer was going to be um, that G Jesus left his charge before his community felt they were ready, um, mm -hmm. and there there is always in transition and leadership transition there is always the the loss the sense of the community that they're not ready but actually often that transition if the leader has done their job before they leave the latent potential and the treasure that's planted within that community rises to the surface as there is uh, as there is space. So I do think in one one sense there will always be that will it fly, will it die vulnerability that's felt by both the leader that's leaving and the community that, that remains. But I think your job is to place within them and call out of them the, the leadership potential that, that God has placed within them. Um, and my other my other comment would just be if if you're not called to stay and don't have the vision to stay, the worst thing for you and the worst thing for that congregation is for you to stay. Mm -hmm. So you're actually not serving them by staying beyond actually where there is a, a grace and a call and a vision to stay. And so actually leaving can be the best thing for a community. And so just naming and knowing that it that's in God's domain, not your domain. And if you can look Jesus in the eye, having prayed and have a sense that there is there is a, a shift in the calling, the vision and a new season, then be accountable, be prayerful and, and make that decision, trusting that God has placed within that community all they need to get the job done. Thanks, folks. Now, Hanukkah, the panel aren't all mind readers. They don't all know your exact situation. But do you want to come back and ask anything more or comment on anything that you've heard? Um, no, it, I think it, they're all very sound and wise um, pieces of advice. I think the I feel in some sense I've, you know, as long as I've been here, which is just over four years, I've been trying to prepare the people for change. But due to circumstances not within my own hands you know I, I feel it's still not clear what is the next step and mm -hmm. it's not for want of trying uh, to breach uh, the these conversations uh, it hasn't happened yet and 
that's just frustrating, but it's ultimately also something I need to contend with that if it's not within my or my session's uh, powers to make something happen, then we just have to find resources to deal with that, you know. Uh, and for me then personally discern wh where that leaves me. If, if I can't do what I thought I was called to do here, then does that, you know, mean that my call has shifted or, or I don't know. Yeah, but thank you for the various um, pieces of advice. Thanks, Hanukkah. Folks are being busy in the chat, which is great. Mike Goss, you're doing a good job of answering everybody's <laughs> questions. I wouldn't expect anything less. Sarah was asking, she says, I'm the new minister of a new charge, technically, as during the vacancy it went from a linkage to a union. Rich, don't worry about not understanding the language. One thing that I will have to be having to work on with the Kirk session is reducing the number of buildings as we currently have three properties not including the manse. How do I work with them to create a new church so that one church doesn't feel lessened or favoured more but that it becomes a new identity with a unified vision? So we're building a new community. I don't think the question is as much about the buildings as it is about bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's difficult to answer that in a in, 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 in a couple of short sentences in a way, but 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 I think I think you in a way the answer is actually in the question about that sense of creating identity um, and, and 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 working out who you are, what you're about, what in a sense is God calling you as a congregation to do, um, and 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 I, I I think it's 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 taking time to 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 enable the character of that new congregation to emerge and um, taking time for the separate elements within it to hear each other's stories so that they understand that, that, that there, there are shared experiences that have led them to this point. There are shared um, histories, but there are also things that are significant and important. Um, why did we bring this communion table from the other building into here, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's these kind of things. Um, and I think sometimes it's, it's, it's getting something that's actually brand new just for them. Um, when I was interim minister in Govan, it was three buildings that eventually went into one. And um, what I think we, when, when we had refurbished the, the remaining building, um, and what I realised is it was like living with all your old granny's second-hand furniture. Um, you know, we had more communion tables than, than, than you could ask for. We had all of this old stuff shipped in. We had everybody's favourite banner and, 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 and then we found more in cupboards um, and, and that sparked all sorts of conversations. And, and, and maybe Govan was Govan, but, but we were able to do a kind of a branding exercise that, that when we, we, we went to, when Heart and Soul was there, we went wearing our Govan and Lindhouse t-shirts and we all went as unity and we had, then, then it developed into sweatshirts and all the rest of it. And, and so just kind of creating activities where we all kind of came together as one. And, and after the building had been refurbished and we reopened, we had this space in the wall and, and, and I felt it needed something. And, and, and I was on Facebook and there, there, there's a lady who's called the Ferocious Cross Lady and she does these beautiful crosses. And, and we had sold, I don't tell the, the general trustees, but we'd sold it off and off tables or something or other and we had about 700 pounds and so we used that money to buy one of these crosses and the day of our um, rededication of the building we in a sense unveiled that and it was something just they had something that was brand new to them <coughs> and, and 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 that in a way is is recognizing the old but actually saying you're a new entity and and what 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 can you generate here as these new people together? Right. Liz, were you going to come in? Yeah, it was. Elmer's already say, said it. It's about our stories. Our stories are really profound. They're a way and a way of getting into who we are. You know, into that identity, but also bringing the stories together to form a new identity. It's the story of the people of God, isn't it? We've been in a, a, a growing young process with a number of other congregations and the thing that they uh, are repeating there again and again is that 
people don't so much resist uh, change as resist loss and and it, naming the loss I think and working through the grief of that loss but it's recognizing that we're not to be left in our loss what is the gain that can come out of this and that's the that's the new vision that's the new possibility that's the and we have to get to that but we have to work through the grief yes but but we've not to be left in our grief and the the time has to, has to come where we 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 go for the the you know the the united vision mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just echo echo Neil and I was going to go back to what Neil mentioned earlier around vision, values and vehicles. There does need to be a alignment on all of those three. And so actually that that sense for me, a community has identity, then ministry, then activity. And so the identity is who are we? What's our story? What's our purpose? Our ministry is how do we live into being good news in our community, our network, our neighbourhood? And then activity is how do we actually make that real? And often we flip it and go the other way. So we're, we're kind of arguing over activity and we're busy, which defines the ministry within the community that actually just then defines who we are. And so as you're coming together to create that new space, it's vision first, then values, then vehicles. It's identity first, then ministry, then activity. So don't get caught up in compromise or conversation around activity and vehicles. You, you, you have to go kind of high, higher up the tree to, to Neil's comment of sort of what's the loss, what's the prize, what's the vision? Um, and, the, and the other thing I would say in those sort of situations, um, when I when I was taught to cross, cross the road as a, as a young boy, it was the green cross code. So it was stop look and listen mm -hmm. and so in any of those situations i always say use the green cross code stop mm -hmm. look and listen because often if we don't stop we're in that assumption instinct unspoken values it's it is it's where we put the communion table how we do the coffee we've always done it this way and we do it this and so if we don't stop and actually look at what do we value why do we value it? how do you do this what do you do what do we do and then listen to the other then we're able to find that place of, of commonality but often we're, we're too busy acting or we're instinctive or we're in assumption and that's where the tension comes and that's where loss feels more both large and emotive because it becomes a us versus them rather than a, a we and a listening process of something new. Brilliant, thank you. Folks, a question that maybe impacts all of us in some way shape or form, criticism when it comes, personal criticism, how do you cope with how it feels and how do you respond? Just ignore it, Kay. <laughs> you like you, yes. yeah. Oh, I like it. <laughs> um. so when, one of my um, mentors used to always tell me that in any criticism, there's maybe 1%, you know, even if we, dismiss it out of hand there's maybe one percent that has um truth so I, I try and sit with that before the dismissing it out of hand but, but you know I, I do my best not to um take it com completely on to work out what is mine and and what might be for me to change and what what is someone else's and also um to and this is the difficult bit be compassionate about where or the, the person that's bringing that criticism where they are and where where they're coming from that's the more difficult bit the compassion for them yeah that, that's what that's what i i was going to say that, that liz has said there's there's always a grain of truth and elements of truth something for you to learn even if that criticism is badly delivered unjustly deserved at the wrong moment in the wrong way that there is always something and the, and the minute we close ourselves down to criticism we cease to be learners we cease to have that posture of humility so it is listening and looking for the grain of truth within what is said um, and then also I I would say again for me it's been it's having a trusted council of reference for me to be able to say this is what's come up it, is this true and I'm completely missing it, misreading the situation, it's a blind spot and it's actually really relevant or actually do you see that in me or would, 
this is the decision I made or the conversation I had, this is how it was heard. Is that sort of cognizant and you would say that I think that or it, does it have resonance? And so I think having people that not yes men and women that just go, no, they're wrong, you're right, you're brilliant. They, they need to be able to challenge you and say, no, that, that person's criticism actually does hold, hold water. It, it is true and you need to do it. So I think looking for the truth and then having a, a safe, trusted council of reference to be able to, to see and discern where is the truth within it? Where is the change needed? And, and where do I need to, if it's, not, if it's not needed or it's not relevant or it's not right, how do I then go back and compassionately but firmly communicate that process? We love our grand and formal titles, Rich. So can you clarify for us what you mean by a trusted council of reference? Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, of course. Um, so, so for instance, so to give you an example, live example, yesterday I spent two hours on Zoom with my two accountability partners. So they are sim similar age to me, early 40s, um, similar stage in terms of leadership. And so I talked to both of them for 20 minutes every Friday. And they they know me, so they know about me, both the, the sort of the good, the bad and the ugly on that kind of side. But they also know my heart, my hope, my weaknesses, my blind spots. So they are a safe place. So we were talking about three to five year plans in terms of marriage, parenting, family, in terms of ministry and in terms of local mission. And so they are the sort of people that I can go. This is what's coming back from a few people. So their challenge to me was around my diary yesterday and schedule and pace my challenge around. So it's those sort of peers. And then I have two mentors, again, a combination of mentorship, spiritual direction, accountability, life wisdom. And again, I'm able to, to process either the, the minutiae of one conversation like this. This is one conversation I've had or this feels like a theme of challenge that I'm receiving from outside what do you see in my life so they're people that i've submitted to not not necessarily in a organizational that they're my boss but there is a there's a spiritual and relational influence and and i have committed to listen to their challenge rather than just that we're very in very dangerous territory if we dismiss everything or surround ourselves with people that call us heroes and say yes to everything like that the minute we don't have the ability to be challenged strongly and with integrity it's a very dangerous place so that that's my sort of council reference is putting along us alongside me and around me people that know me and can challenge me brilliant thank you i've got one eye on the time here so i'm going to bring you one final question and maybe a couple of folks can speak to it and then we'll we'll tie up and neil's going to finish for us so deborah's saying my session have lost their vision and impetus to do anything with a third of them um, very elderly so how do we re-engage them instead of me feeling like i'm carrying them mm -hmm. How do you help others with these new and changing expectations? Um, I, I think when I go into some congregations I've gone into, that they're, they're quite defeated uh, and they're in quite a defeated place. And, and, and they're, they're, they're feeling sorry for themselves and they're feeling bitter uh, 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 about what has been done to them by, by, by Presbytery or the National Church or whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and in, 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 in some ways, I, I think there is something about allowing them to rest a little, um, about rest a little and recuperation um, and not placing upon them too many expectations or even too many demands. Um, and, 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 and in a way, kind of nurturing them along a wee bit. Now, it's not giving them entirely what they want. It's, 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 it's uh, for me, I always try to name the challenge. I, I'll tell them this is a challenge I'm, I'm setting before you, whether it's a new hymn that, that week um, or, 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 or whether it's something bigger. And then I think it's just simply looking and, and I would be looking for the, 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 the points within the congregation that you need to allow um, to, to, to die. Um, those points that you just, in a sense, need to help them let go of. Um, and then looking for the points where there is something that is nurturing, both nurturing of them, of you, of, of the church situation. 
Um, and it may well be that, that they continue as there are and, and some of your time and your energy goes into then working in, in that new place or that new thing or with these w whatever, whatever. Um, but 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 I, I think there comes a point where, in in a sense, you 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 just have to love them. Um, you know the story of the 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 American church that were sponsoring missionaries to 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 Haiti, and they went over to check out what was it that that that, that made a good missionary, and 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 one of the indigenous folks saying a a good missionary must love Jesus, and must love Haitians. Um, and, and, and so there's your starting point uh, in, in, in terms of, 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 of where you meet them before you're seeking to, 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 to move them, renew them um, or, or, or just commend them for what they have done in the past. Thanks. Final comment? Uh, Rich. My, my, my final comment would be um, as a father of three, it is far easier to get one of my kids out the house than all three of them. And so if you're trying to get everyone mo mobilized and moved and cajoled, it is it is very, very hard. So mm -hmm. work, work with the willing and calibrate your challenge for the whole. So a, a, a missiologist called Ralph Winter um, talked about sodal and modal and, and the biblical framework would be yeast in the dough. So what you're looking for is the small bands that do have the energy, that do have the vision. It may just be one or two. And so how the not necessarily just elderly in terms of age, but just those that are tired, I would say think about permission and prayer. So galvanize them to pray and allow them to give permission for one or two to go on an advanced party and just try and test. So not everyone's got to leave the house and go on a trip. Actually, you stay, you pray, let's just send one or two. So I wouldn't try and get everyone galvanised, mobilised and dressed them out the house. I would leave a couple of them in their pyjamas and just go go with the one and just try. And that then begins to build some testimony, some faith, some encouragement, some story that then others will slowly go. So it's I, I talk about the marathon picture of waves of runners going off rather than one giant start line. So how do you start with a few? and just let the others rest, pray, and give permission for a season. Brilliant, thank you. And some smiles as people are imagining their Kirk session in their pyjamas. Um, oh, we're nearly apologies. out of time. Apologies, yeah. <laughs> mental images. <laughs> just a couple of things to say. Um, through Ascend, uh, anybody who is a full-time Word and Sacrament minister is entitled to £240 per year for pastoral supervision that will help walk with you through some of these challenging experiences of ministry. There's also a coaching team who you could be um, lined up with to have some alongside experience in an ongoing way, or we offer ministerial um, development conversations that are an opportunity for a one-off, digging deep, allowing somebody maybe to look at your diary and to look at your priorities and to help you sift and decide what might be next. All of those things are available through the Ascend website, but it's important to say with coaching, there's going to be a cohort starting in the autumn. We've got 10 spaces of those who would appreciate through the autumn being part of a coaching relationship. You'll hear, see more about all of those different types of support on the Ascend website. And if you're here today, you presumably have made yourself uh, aware of the Ascend website at some point. And the other thing to say is that we have another webinar next week on Monday at the same time, where we're going to be thinking about working collaboratively. And we see it being a partner webinar to today because part of how we respond to things is not to look to ourselves, but to look to the potential that there is in others. But before we finish, we want to just come back to one of our panel members and allow them to speak scoop up um, some of the thoughts um, and reflections both that they brought today or that might be helpful in the light of everything we've, we've been talking about. So Neil, just over to you to finish off. Thanks Kay. What I'm, what's, what I'm sensing is that of course it's all about the love of God, isn't it? It's all about the love of God in Christ. Um, it's about experiencing that love. It's about knowing that we're loved. It's about sharing that love with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's about loving our neighbour as we love ourselves, um, but we're also recognising that that God is the source of this. And what I'm hearing 
and and realizing afresh for myself and I think for us for us all is that that ability to say help is so important and the very fact that that we are here together like this is evidence of your willingness to say help here I'm going to tune in I'm going to listen I want to learn I want to I want to share good practice um, and, and, and so let's continue in that. Let's continue in this humility. Let's continue in this openness and this vulnerability and this readiness and, and desire to, to know what God wants us to do. But I think as ministers, you know, the ability to, to love others as we love ourselves is, is, is so important that we, we, that we know that we're beloved um, and that we work with the cycle of grace that starts with acceptance, that moves to significance and an activity and an achievement, rather than thinking that we've got to prove ourselves. Um, naturally, when we're in a new job or in a new situation, we want to prove ourselves, but but it's Jesus that has done that for us, isn't it? And and continues to do that for us and, and with us. And so Shabbat, Shabbat, Sabbath, you know, it's not a it's not a suggestion, it's it's a command. And and, and, and Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and wabbit and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You know, I'm not going to lay anything heavy on you folks. Uh, you know, come and come and experience this rest. And so it's learning the unforced rhythms of grace, as Peterson puts it. It's, it's making sure that our, our activity is punctured. Our pride is punctured by, 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 by Shabbat. And that's that's weekly, yes, but it's, it's daily as well. It's, it's daily realizing that, that the day starts at night and and, and and that's a place of grace. It's it's that rest. Do I've, I'm up five times in the night, I'm afraid. It's a time of life. But nonetheless, I recognize, I recognize night time is the start of the day. If you look at Genesis, that's where the day starts. It's night, then day, the first day and so on. It's grace. Uh, and, and so it's it's learning the unforced rhythms of grace that I would encourage us. And that's, that's, that means that we're seeing help. It means that we're we're daily seeking the Lord, that we're weekly receiving that. Stop it. Stop. Shabbat. Stop trying to pretend that you're God. Stop trying to pretend that you're in control. Stop it. Stop it. You can't you can't save the world. You can't save the cart. You can't save Scotland. But Jesus can. Um, I'll leave it there. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Neil. Folks, thanks so much for your time today. Our huge thanks to the panel. We hope we'll see you next Monday. You do need to sign up on Eventbrite if you're going to be there. Uh, we hope the rest of your day is good and do be in touch if you've got any more thoughts or ideas for anything else that we can be offering in this space. Thank you.